How to maintain a godly perspective. That's what we're going to consider today. Um, the reality of the life that you and I have to live in the environment in which we have to live it is that it's difficult. Um, I look around and I see uh, all of you wonderful people. Some of you, I know your stories a little more than others. Some of you know my story. We get into each other's lives. We're a family. That's what family does. But as you do that, you realize that there are some persons going through some things that are very difficult. Um, some have been through some things. Some are about to go into some things. Um, and it's all because we live in a world that is sin-cursed. Okay, that's just the reality of it. Um, everything was perfect until Adam and Eve sinned, and then everything went haywire after that. The reason that we get old and our wrinkles start kicking in and all of that stuff, it's because of sin. And the world is groaning from the same reason as you and I are. So when we think about how to maintain a godly perspective, if we're honest, we have to be talking about this in the context of difficulty. Okay, it doesn't mean that life isn't worth living, doesn't mean that everything is despair, doesn't mean that there's no good thing in life, but the reality of living in life long enough is that you're gonna find, you're gonna have some issues, you're gonna have some trouble, some difficulties. Uh, it's been said that there are three basic kinds of people. Those who are experiencing a difficult situation right now, those who have come out of a difficult situation in the past, and those who are about to go into one. And again, this isn't to suggest that you shouldn't look for the flowers in life and the peace of God in life and all the rest of it, but that's just how it is. Um, for some of you, if you're young, maybe you haven't appreciated that some of the things that go wrong, they don't just happen to other people, they happen to us as well. Um, and so when we're talking about maintaining a godly perspective, the first thing that we have to be able to do is honestly say, wow, living in this world isn't easy. It's just not easy. You look on the television, you look around the world, uh, you appreciate the pain that's out there and the pain that you and I experience as well. And it's like, well, how in the world am I supposed to keep a godly perspective? How do I deal with the tension between God's word, which is true, and the experiences that I see all around me and some that I'm experiencing myself? How do I deal with this tension of God's word and being absolutely true and faithful and God wins and all of God's children win and all of that with the difficulties that I experience? How in this tension of life can I maintain a godly perspective? That's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. James 1 verse 2 to 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. A couple of things to highlight there. You know, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If I were to ask you, and even if I were to ask myself, would you like to be spiritually mature? Would you like to be lacking nothing? The answer obviously would be what? Yes, that's what we all want. That's what God wants for us. And that's what we know that we want because we want what God wants us to have. But if we go through scripture and we go through life and we appreciate that spiritual maturity and the idea of not lacking anything and that's not necessarily financial and all the rest of it is the idea of having everything that we need found in God, knowing that we're secure, not lacking anything spiritually. The Bible says that we have everything in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ, so it's in that context. But if the reality and the goal is spiritual maturity, and it is, then we have to appreciate what comes before it. James says, consider it pure joy, or another way you can look at that is consider it a pure benefit. Okay, that's the idea. It's not necessarily saying, oh, let's have a party because everything is going very wrong in my life and I'm experiencing very difficult circumstances. But the idea is count it all benefit. It's beneficial. It's beneficial, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The idea of perseverance, it's such a, a strong word. It's a word that God is still build, building into me. It's a word that, you know, I look at my kids and I watch them and it's, how, it's so easy to encourage somebody else to persevere until it's your time. It's, it's easy. 
And it's the right thing to do. You know, as a dad, I'm not going to tell my kids to quit, but I'm just like, you can do it. You can do it. I know it's hard. You can do it. But then the test comes, and God's asking me the same thing. It's like, Joe, you can do it. I'm like, God, I don't think so. You can do it. You can do it. But it's sometimes very easy to encourage somebody else, recognizing that perseverance is essential, knowing that you want spiritual maturity for them and for them to lack nothing. But sometimes we don't like to take the same medicine or apply the same thing because it's not easy. Perseverance isn't easy. But I want what God wants me to have, and I want to be spiritually mature. I'm not spiritually mature yet. I'm more mature than I was, but God always has some maturity to do in my life. And he shares it to me almost every day. And the days that he doesn't is because I pretend that I'm not listening to him. He shows me areas all the time that I need to grow up in. But that's what I want. And so if... Trials and the difficult circumstances, some that I invite on myself for my own stupidity, some that just because Satan hates me, some because life is what it is, if those are the things that are going to cause me to eventually reach the goal of spiritual maturity and being in a place where I'm lacking nothing, that's what I want. That's what I want. I hope that we all want that. But it's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. So how do we maintain a godly perspective? There are five things to keep in mind, okay? Five things to keep in mind. Um, God is good. God is good. He's just good. The Bible says he's good. If we're able to, um, in the right perspective, compare our lives and seeing what God has done in them, we'll see that God is good. But that's fact number one. God is good. He is good. Two, life is hard. The Bible describes that. Okay, describes God being good, but it also describes life being very difficult. The third thing is this, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That means that God is in control. God knows what will happen. God has the authority to see things happen and to make things as they should based on what he wants to do. He is in charge. Okay, that's what God is sovereign means. God is all wise. There are things that God knows that you and I will never know. If it were possible, there were things that God would forget that we would never know. God is all wise. He knows everything. And that's one of the things that he's constantly encouraged me with. I can get into my moods. I've been in one kind of funky little stretch lately, and I've just been trusting God to help me. Because when I'm funky, it's not nice for other people. I'm not a horrible guy, but it happens. I get funk. People say stuff to me. It hurts. I think I've dealt with something that I haven't dealt with and all the rest of it. And one of the things that happens is I might feel as if I have the wisdom to deal with stuff over and above what God says needs to be done. But I'm not God. I'm not all wise. I have limited, limited, limited wisdom, but not God. God is all wise. So when you and I find ourselves in this situation and God says this and we're saying that, let's just go with what God says because God's all wise and we're not. God is all powerful. God is all powerful. God has unlimited strength. Unlimited strength. He's all powerful. He's all powerful. Think about that. He is all powerful. You know, my son loves his Lego and, and he's always creating these huge trucks and they're doing all this types of stuff. The last thing he did was this crane and it's so cool, like you push the buttons. It's Lego, like I remember Lego when I was growing up. It was nice, but it wasn't like that. Like the stuff they do nowadays is pretty incredible. But it's a crane, right? So my mind goes to like a real crane and you can see the the power associated with that crane. Um, Not the fastest machine in the world, but very effective because there's power involved in it. Um, And so when you think of all powerful, like Whatever you think is powerful has no bearing on what we mean when we say God is all-powerful. You can never come to grips with how much power God has. I can never come to grips with that because he's all-powerful. So those are five core things that we're going to look at one by one. God is good. Life is hard. God is sovereign. God is all-wise. God is all-powerful. Now, in order to sort of grasp the truth of what God says in any and every circumstance. We have to be honest about a couple things. The first is this. We've used this diagram before and just a big circle that says all truth. The idea is that, let's say, since we're talking about how to have a godly perspective, this represents all the truth associated with that, okay? Could be prayer, could be anything, but of course this is our topic today. So this represents all the truth that there possibly could be about how to live a godly 
life and how to have a godly perspective. This is the problem. You and I have a worldview that fits within here that doesn't incorporate all of the truth. It's always the case. So your worldview and my worldview, we all have them. Your worldview many times gives rise to your opinions. Everyone has an opinion. Opinions, I want to encourage you with this, I've told you this before, but opinions are valid for one or two reasons. Not three, just one or two. It tells you how close what you think is to what God thinks or how far away what you think is from what God says. That's it. Other than that, your opinion and my opinion ain't worth squat. Okay, your opinion is a barometer which oftentimes shares up what your worldview really is. Now, the reality of having a worldview is that how is it that you grew up? What did church mean to you? What did family life mean to you? Were you teased at school? Did you get in trouble as a boy? Did people call you names? Did, all of these things shape who you are and help shape your worldview. If you don't think you have a worldview, then that's the number one problem. You have a worldview. So right now, you have an idea about what it means to live and have a godly perspective. Some of it might be, you know what, as long as I do my quiet time, even though I don't go to church, and even though I don't go to prayer meeting, that'll be enough. That's enough to maintain a godly perspective, maybe. For some of you, it could be as long as I show up for my ministry, and no one knows that I've gone missing, even though I haven't done my quiet time for three months, it's all right. But based on the way that you and I grew up, you have a worldview. So the most important thing that you and I can do is identify this worldview. If you are here when you're saying, I don't have a worldview, I got it right, and you have a worldview. Your worldview is that you're always right. But we all have a worldview, okay? And the problem with our worldview, in our opinion, we live in such a day and age where we celebrate opinion, we celebrate who's right, we celebrate who's most articulate. You could be most articulate and debate something that's absolutely wrong, but still win the argument because you were most articulate. It doesn't make any sense. So you and I have to appreciate that this is true, that all of this is around us. We will never know all truth. So once we identify what we think is, and then we identify what God says really is, we need to make some shifts in our lives. Amen? Amen. That's just true. All right. Now, when we think about those five things, again, let's break it down a little bit. God is good versus God doesn't care. That might be your worldview. God is good, the Bible teaches us that, but you may have gone through life and had some very difficult experiences happen to you, and you've come to the conclusion that, well, God might be good for some people, but God doesn't care about me. I'll still go to church, I'll still read the Bible because I think it's still true, it's still helpful, but God's not good to me. And so, Whenever you have a worldview, whenever you have an opinion, you have to match it up with what God says. But this, for some of us, right now, I know that this is part of what we think. I know that. Somebody thinks and has a tendency to think like that. God works for other people, but God doesn't work for me. But that's not true. Another thing, life is hard versus trouble is your own fault. One of the things that Jesus was talking about in John, what was it, John chapter 9, there was a story there, you can read about it. Uh, he meets some, a blind man, and the disciples, Jesus is with his disciples, and he meets this blind man, and the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, well, Jesus, who sinned? Was it the guy that's blind, or was it their parents? Because in our formula, the only reason that bad things happen to people is they're messed up, and they're living a jacked up life. That's what the disciples told to Jesus. So for some of us, we might have a worldview that says, you know what, if anything goes wrong in my life, it has to be because of sin, something's going wrong, and, and you'll hear this. You'll hear this taught from the pulpit. It's false. No, you can get yourself into some mess, so I'm not making light of that. You can do some stupid things that bring about some difficult consequences, and yes, it's your own fault, and yes, it's my own fault. But life is so much more complex than that. And Jesus has to tell his disciples in John 9, it's not because of any sin. This is just, I guess, what happened. But he also said, this is going to be for my glory because watch what I'm going to do. So you might have an idea or a worldview that says, you know what? Everything, everything, everything is like black and white. It's not like that. More complicated than that. God is sovereign versus I'm in control. 
God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's in control. Rest is I'm in control. Some of you may have grown up in situations that you had to take the bull by the horns, and if you didn't, you would never have gotten anything that you needed, and that's shaped your worldview to the extent that you now still live like that. So God is sovereign. Yeah, I have a space for God being sovereign, but I still got to maintain some control because, after all, it's the only way that it's worked out for me. So God might be, you might be sovereign with, like, all of that stuff, but this stuff right here, I'm the king of this castle. Some of you may have that worldview, that idea. Um, God is all wise versus I'm as smart as God is. Talked about this a little while ago. God is wise. He's smart. He's all wise. That's just who God is. And you and I will never know enough to have a conversation with God about anything. Job found that out. And I'm not knocking Job. Job was a righteous man. The Bible describes that. But he got to a point in his own life where he said, well, God, it's time for us to have a one-on-one -on -one because there are some things going on that go against my theology and my wisdom, and so it's time for you and I to have a conversation. And we know who won that conversation. We know who won that debate. God did. God will always win that. God is all-powerful versus I'll do it myself. This is one of the things that we really need to um, get to a place of humility in. One of the things that God has been, and I didn't know that this was what God was doing in my life, and he's still doing it, so I'm not suggesting that I've learned it and I've grasped it, but he's starting to make some things click in my mind. And one of the things that's been so hard for me as God continues to teach me humility is like this comparison thing. Now, God might call me to do this or do this, and it's just like, well, God, I, I want to do what you want me to do, but what about me? Like, what, what about the stuff that I like? Like, wh when do I get to do what I want to do, um, and how do I compare that with what you're telling me to do, and how do I become all right with doing what you want me to do while giving up more control of my life? I don't like that. And, and, and just recently, God has been showing me that that's part of what he wants to grow in me, and it's also part of what I've been putting my heel into. And I didn't even know. I still don't like it all that much. But it's just this space. So I'm like, well, God, how is it that you want me to keep doing what you want me to do? You want me to be okay doing what you want me to do? But the process of me giving up every right to everything that I want to do, like sort of goes out of the window. And it's uncomfortable. And I don't know what to do with that yet, God. But he's helping me. He's teaching me. Just one day at a time, one minute at a time. And that's been very frustrating for me because there are things about me that still says I want to be in control. I want to have the last say. I want to do things myself. Your plan is good, God. I got that. I know that. I want what you want me to have, but surely I can have a little bit of control in this thing. And I'm learning that. It's not very comfortable. Not very comfortable. But these are five of the things, and yours may be different. Okay, but these are the five things we're going to look at, and these are some of the things that come to mind when we try to outthink God and say that, God, you know what, what you're saying is true, but how about my opinion, too? It doesn't work that way. Uh, God is good. God is good. Let's say it together. God is good. Let's say it one more time. God is good. God is good. We sing a simple chorus that says that God is good. Um, Psalm 84, verse 11 says this. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. The idea with blameless there is upright, you know, doing the right things, not perfect, but the idea is that it's a Godward orientation. So if that's your life and my life and our heart, then the Bible's clear. God doesn't withhold things from us. For me... That can be the first place that I go to when things don't go the way that I think they should go. Or God doesn't give me the thing that I say that I know I need or I say I think I need and he doesn't give it to me or he's making me wait or whatever the situation is. Sometimes I can go to that place of, oh, God, you're holding out on me. It's the same lie that the devil told Adam and Eve. It's the whole root of the mess that you and I are still in today. The devil told them, God's holding out on you. He just doesn't want you to have what you could have. If you and I get to a space of thinking that God is holding out on us, we're not going to trust him. We're not going to get to a place of saying, well, God is a good God. Again, it's going to be, well, God's good for that person, 
and I've seen him come through in that situation. But if we have this cynicism that says, you know what, God's withholding stuff from me, it's, not, it's gonna go wrong. It's gonna go wrong. The, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing, nothing, no good thing, nothing that you need, nothing that you need, nothing, nothing that God knows will be beneficial to you, nothing. He will withhold nothing because he loves you too much. So if we have the right perspective, we can start to celebrate the goodness of God. But if we don't, we're going to have this cynicism that says, wow, God, I thought you were good up until that minute, but no. God withholds nothing, 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 nothing. Life is hard. How many of you know that life is hard? Life is hard. Life is hard. It's worth living. So again, we're not talking about, you know, going all down there, but it's difficult. It was difficult for Jesus. It was difficult for every single one of his disciples, and it's going to be difficult for us. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The one thing I love about the Bible, you know, I've done some comparative studies with other religions and stuff, but the Bible just tells you, like, the real deal. There's no pie in the sky stuff. It's no, if you do this, everything's going to be fine. Or, there, it says it's going to be difficult. It's going to be worth living, but it's going to be difficult. And that's the perspective that you and I have to have. I mean, there's so many stories. I'm looking out, and I see so many stories, and some of you have one of some incredibly brave faces today by God's grace. But I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that God already said it was going to be difficult. He said it was going to be hard. He also said he would be with us, but he said it would be hard. So Jesus tells his disciples this. Jesus is about to go to the cross. The disciples had all of these ideas in mind as to what it should look like for a king to be victorious. And Jesus is about to go to the cross. They're saying, well, you know what? You're going to have some trouble. I say, well, didn't you come to defeat Rome and give us peace? Just say, well, you're going to have peace because my Holy Spirit will be with you forever. And then after that, we'll be together forever. But life's going to be difficult. Life's going to be difficult. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Romans 8, verse 28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In other words, God works everything out for his good. Everything out for his good. Uh, best illustration, again, is that of, of, of creating a cake. You've heard me say this before about creating a cake, and you can appreciate all of the different ingredients that go into making a cake. Um, from the start, even if you had to read through uh, the list of ingredients to go in there, if you had no idea about what it was you were making, you would probably be skeptical as to what in the world is going to come out of this thing. You got some vanilla, which is awful by itself. You got some flour and sugar and this and eggs and raw. None of it makes sense. None of it makes sense. Nobody would want any one of those ingredients all by themselves and get excited about it. Nobody. But it isn't until the master baker, God himself, puts all of those ingredients together with the right measurements, with the right time. Some of it's got to rise. Some of it's got to, no, they don't shrink. No, they just rise. But... The right, you see, I don't bake, but the right baker putting all of those things together and then putting it into an oven under the right heat and the right pressure for the right amount of time, then you start to get this aroma that sort of goes through the house and it's just like, oh, okay, that's what it was all about. And then you get to eat it, then you get to taste it and it's just like, this stuff is banging. But if you had started at the beginning, you might have a different perspective. But God is sovereign. He's in control. So when he gives you some vanilla in your life that tastes nasty, that you don't want to taste, but you've probably forgotten about the pinch of salt that's in the back and the, the other stuff that he's put, when he gives you those individual ingredients, and it happens, it's going to taste horrible. It's not going to make any sense. That's when we have to trust God, the master baker of our lives, to put everything together in the right combination, under the right temperature, under the right heat, for the right amount of time, 
to bring about the thing that he always knew he was doing from the beginning. So the challenge is you and I don't know what he's doing. We know ultimately what our redemption looks like. But right here on earth, God's up to a lot of tricks sometimes. I say that reverently because we can't figure them out. I, I was a, um, a scientist before pastoring, and I was quite happy being a scientist. I figured that that's probably the only thing I would be doing for the rest of my life. I like scuba diving. I like looking at birds. I like doing all of those things. I remember when my wife and I were um, dating, and I guess we were engaged by then. Maybe I did this afterward to, to make sure that we would still get married. But anyway, we would be driving, and, um, you know, I would see a bird. You know, if it's full time for me, maybe you want to drive with me, maybe you don't. But breaks happen like that because there might be a bird that I got to see. And that was our first introduction to just how weird I was. But <laughs> I love science. I love science, all right? Um, but interestingly, on this side of it, I still love science as much as I've ever loved it. Um, but now I can look back and see how God was using that and the environment to just burn things into me and grow me in ways, not dreaming that I would be a pastor, not dreaming for a minute that I would be a pastor. But that's how God works. But God knows what measurements, what timing, and he knows what he's doing. He knows the final result from the first ingredient added. And so for you and I, we gotta trust him. We gotta trust in his sovereignty, amen? God is all wise. The Bible says in Romans 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God's wisdom is just deep. Now, hands up if you know who wrote this. Paul, all right, the Apostle Paul. Paul knew God pretty well. You know, God gave him some incredible visions, and he actually gave him a thorn in the flesh, a difficulty, which was to keep him humble because God had revealed so much incredible things to him. This is the Apostle Paul, having spent uh, at least three years in the, in, the, in, the, in the desert, and Jesus Christ himself teaching him one-on-one. -on -one. This is the Apostle Paul, and based on all of the experiences that Paul had with Jesus and with God the Father, he still comes to this conclusion, oh, the depths. Like, like, like who, who can figure God out? We can trust him. We can trust his heart. But don't ever think that you can figure him out because he's all wise. He knows things that we'll never know. He created the heavens and the earth. Enough said. That's like a mic drop. God could do that. I created the heavens and the earth. Done. Who can do that? Who can do that? The thing is still spinning around and the stars still come out and this, like, in the Bible where the, the, the stars are named and it describes God calling them out by name and stuff, they've been doing the exact same thing from the second that God created it. He's all wise. He knew about gravity and all of that stuff. We didn't invent anything. We understood it. It became apparent to us because there was a real God who put it in perspective or put it into place. But the depths of God are beyond us. So I guess that can be sort of daunting as well as frustrating. Or I'll speak for myself. It can be daunting and frustrating for me because I like to think that I'm pretty smart. I like to think that I've got some wisdom that I can get some stuff right and stuff. But keep in mind, anything that you and I do right is because God gave us the wisdom to do it. You and I can do absolute, when you gave my wife some coffee this morning, that was exciting. She was in bed. I said, let me go make her a cup of coffee. No, I love my wife. But the desire to do that, I can't even take credit for that. The desire to please someone who God has given me to help me and to love and protect, I can't take credit for it because that's what God always envisioned should be. He gave me my wife, and then he gave me the motivation and the heart to actually do it. Sometimes you and I take way too much credit for things that we shouldn't be taking credit for. God is all wise. The depth of his knowledge should blow us away. And the last thing is this. God is all powerful. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says this. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. 
nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. In other words, when you can sit down on Mars Hill or in the Senate or anywhere else and you can come up with an idea and figure out how God created the heavens and the earth, then you can pull up a chair to the table. Until then, just recognize that God is God. God is powerful. He's powerful. He's strong. Sometimes my mind goes into the imagination of sort of like the demon world and just his power. The Bible describes in Job where, you know, Satan appears before God with the angels and, and like there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no confusion there. There might be confusion for us, but Satan knows God's power. God knows Satan's limitations. They're there. It's just incredible. But God is all powerful. So God has power that he will use on your behalf and my behalf right now in the circumstances that you go through. But sometimes we can go to God with the perspective that says, well, God, again, you're strong, you're powerful, and I've seen you work on that person's behalf, but I don't think you can handle this situation that I'm in. This situation that I'm in is beyond even your power, God. But God wants to remind us, in order to have a godly perspective, we have to understand that God is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. There's nothing that he can do. Now, this is the challenge, even as we've looked at all five of these, this is the challenge. You can't hold one of those things without the other four. This is the, they're all true. You can go through your Bible. It's all there. And we've just scratched the surface of it. But you can't hold one of them without the other four. And that's the tension. That's the grace that God needs to give us to continue to trust him. If you come to a place, based on your circumstances, and even based on what God's doing in your heart right now, that God is good, okay? But then all of these things, you're saying, well, no, it's all my fault. Life should be better than this. I must have sinned. I must have done something. Or God isn't sovereign. Or, you know, God's smart, but I'm smart too, and God can't handle my situation. Having a godly perspective is not going to work. And this is tension. I'm not going to try to tell you exactly like, you know, it works all of the time. And I personally hold all of these in perfect uh, 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 comparison. Or com I, I, I'm not. But I know from my own experiences that you can't highlight one of these and forget the others and come away with a godly perspective as to God is. It's impossible to do. Because God is all of these things at the same time. God is all of these things. God is good at the same time that life is hard. At the same time, he's sovereign. At the same time, he's all wise. And at the same time, he is all powerful. So I want to encourage us today. We've got to get past information. We've got to get to application. And we've got to really understand how it is that we can go to a God who says he's going to give us everything that we need and get the grace that we need for every specific situation that we face. And one of the greatest situations that I face is keeping all of these in place all at the same time. And I can't do it, but God's grace comes in and God helps me to remember that, yes, Joe, I am good. You remember when, yeah, 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 God, I do, I do. And you remember the last time you tried to take things into your own hands and you remember the, yeah, 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 God, I remember that, yep. And you remember when you've tried to debate as if you were smart enough and how that went? Yeah, yeah, I remember that too. But it's this constant tension. But it's a healthy tension. Never get to a thinking in your mind where you should live a life that has no tension. Because that is a life where you're not thinking. That's a life where you're not applying. I can't tell you these things are easy, but they're all true. And by God's grace, he's going to help us to keep them all in perspective. Because that's when we can live this life and have a godly perspective. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's stand. We're going to be dismissed. I'm not going to call anyone forward. This is a message for all of us. Um, so even as I'm standing here, my heart is open before you. It's open before God. And I just want what God wants me to have. But I understand that what he wants me to have is the right perspective the right perspective. So you might be sitting here right now and you know the issue that you left home with to come here, but you're here. And I believe God wants to use this to encourage us to think through how is it that I can have a godly perspective. First, always remember you have a worldview. 
You have a peculiar or unique way of seeing things, and it is because of the way that you were raised, it was because of the circumstances, it's because of your life's experiences. It's just true. It's not good, bad, or otherwise. It's just true. And so when we start there, then we say, oh, okay, God, I see maybe why what I think is so far away from what you think, because maybe this is part of my stumbling block. But God, I need your grace. I need your grace, God, because I want to agree with what you say, and I want to start from the place that you want me to start with. And God, as I understand that life's difficult, I also want to constantly keep in mind that you're a good God, that you're sovereign, you're the master baker, and you know what you are crafting from the first time that you started that fresh ingredient in my life. God is all wise. God is all powerful. Now, please hear me. I am not making light of situations that we are going through at all, at all. I'm just telling you the best I can, based on God's word, that with his grace, we can hold these five truths, although they sometimes can be in tension, by God's grace, we can hold them in the right perspective and live the life that God wants us to have. So we're going to pray right there where you are, from your heart to daddy's heart. Daddy, tell me what my worldview is. And again, if you're sitting there and saying, I don't have a worldview, that's your first problem. You have a worldview and you don't want to admit it. Just say, God, tell me my worldview, God. Tell me, like, why am I so at odds sometimes with what it is you want me to do? Why is it so difficult? God will help you with that. And then just pray through these five things. God, would you help me to keep all of these things in mind so that I can live life with a godly perspective? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, God, that you love us the way that you do. You love us enough to tell us the truth about this world and how we fit into it, God, and even the stuff that doesn't seem to go right in our lives, God. And Father, I pray that you would help us to continue to just pursue you, God, pursue your wisdom, God, to pursue your love, God, to pursue your strength even on our behalf, God. Help us, God, to see things from your perspective, God. Help us never to lose sight of the whole picture, God. It's, it's so easy to do, God. I know it happens in my life, God. Help me to not lose sight, God, of the whole picture, God. You are a good God, and yes, life is hard, God. But you're sovereign, you're all-wise, and you're all-powerful. So, Father, I pray for your grace to help us keep all of those things, God, in the right perspective so that together, With your grace, by your spirit, we can live life with a godly perspective. I thank you, God, that uh, you've given us everything for life and godliness, God. That's what you say in your word, Father. And so, Father, I pray that we'll believe it and that we'll walk in it, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm